All right, great. I think we'll get started and we'll just keep letting folks in as they show up. Um, welcome to the second PGH Photo Fair Speaker Series event tonight. We're really excited to have Essa Epstein here with us. Um, before we jump into things, I want to give you a quick Zoom intro. Um, you're all probably pretty used to Zoom by now, but just in case, um, you know, find that chat function. We're going to use that for questions tonight. Um, anytime, you know, there, there will be a presentation from ASA and at any point you can throw in a question and then we'll, we'll address them after the presentation. So Evan will go through and pull some of those questions out. Um, please do keep in mind that we want to make sure this is a safe, respectful community space. So as you use the chat and if you have your camera on, just be aware of that. Um, we also want to make sure you have a good viewing experience. So take a moment and um, look at the top of your screen. If you're on a computer, you can choose the view options uh, selection there. And if you just hit the little arrow um, to bring down options, you can select side by side. And that's a great way to make sure that your presentation doesn't get interrupted by the faces that you see. Once you have side by side up, you can see there are two little double lines and those can, you can move from left to right and make the screen a little bigger or smaller. Um, it's a great way to just get everything aligned and make sure you have a good viewing option. Um, and then if you choose speaker view versus gallery view, you'll be able to see one face versus many faces. So up to you entirely what you'd like to see. Um, we want to thank the Hillman, William T. Hillman Foundation for supporting us and supporting this programming. And um, with that, I think I'll turn it over to Evan and Essa. Are you guys there? We are here. Great. <laughs> then I'm going to stop sharing my screen. All right. Great to see everybody. I can see all your faces now. Give us a wave. Hey. <laughs> Fabulous. Um, so I'm going to hand it off to Evan and um, uh, Evan, you can get us going. Great. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, uh, some of you are recognized from our from our last talk with uh, with with Michael and uh, any of you who are new. Um, thank you for joining us and we hope we'll see you at future future events. Um, before I get started with Essa. Uh, I wanted to uh, talk about an idea that we have for future talks. Um, one of the things we talked about with Michael and something that he's done with his uh, photo group out in LA is a kind of um, collector um, show and tell where he invited three, four, five different collectors to each show a few pictures from their collection and talk about them briefly. And we thought that that was a great idea and we started to ask around to people uh, who might want to contribute to that. But then um, I saw another group did something which was even more democratic and which we would love to give a try as well. As I see this mosaic of faces and, and know that there are uh, an incredible variety of, of visual perspective, uh, perspectives and collections from the people that I'm seeing on the screen, we're gonna just put it out there that if you would like to talk about a picture or two from your collection, we would love to see it and have you and have you participate. So Casey's going to put a, a page up on our website within the next day or two. And if you would like to contribute to a, a PGH Photo Fair talk at the end of October, just use that form and send the picture that you'd like to show and a few words about either where you got it or why it's important to you or why you like to look at it, anything that you think would be an interesting couple of minutes. And we'll pick, you know, um, the sort of top 20 and we'll make an evening out of it. And we hope that uh, that's something that will um, bring more of you kind of into the fold of, 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 of talking about your pictures. And also we like that it is more democratic and it's not us choosing who's an important enough collector. And just, if you have pictures that you love, then, then you're a collector and you should talk about what you love and, and we'd like to represent you. So if that sounds good to you, please be looking on our website in the next couple of days and Casey will have that up. Um, so on to tonight's uh, uh, main event. 
uh, Essa Epstein, uh, and I have known each other for for many, many years from back when I lived in New York. And, and of course, uh, like many of the people um, that are uh, in the PGH Photo Fair realm, we cross paths uh, at various fairs around the world and, and, and sort of keep up to date. Um, and I always thought that Essa's perspective and also the program of her gallery um, are, if not unique, then certainly unusual. And so we wanted to bring her voice into uh, our speaker series so that she could talk about uh, um, where she's coming from and what she likes to show and a number of the artists who I think will be new to many of our viewers. Um, I won't do an extensive sort of formal introduction since Essa's talk covers that very well. Um, her main remarks are pre-recorded, so when she starts her screen sharing, it'll be a set piece. And then uh, when that finishes, we'll go back to the screen sharing and I'll be able to see your requested um, questions in chat and we'll do a little uh, Q&A to finish things off, okay? Uh, welcome, Essa, and whenever you're ready, please uh, start your screen. All right, thank you, Casey, and thank you, Evan. That's a little bit of a repeat from here. Let's see if I can get this going. Thank you, Casey and Evan and PGH for inviting me to speak today. I'm disappointed that we're not all together in Pittsburgh, but I'm honored that everyone tuned in this evening. Sorry, we're having some technical difficulties. I'm gonna have you um, just try to share your screen one more time. Down oh, the yeah. Okay, perfect. And then if you just do that um, from the start, I think we'll be able to see that a little better. Yeah, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Casey and Evan and PGH for inviting me to speak today. I'm disappointed that we're not all together in Pittsburgh, but I'm honored that everyone tuned in this evening. As a gallerist, archivist, and curator, I'm interested in the organization, research, and interpretation of primarily lens-based material. Combining these lines of inquiry with my almost lifelong love of photography, my gallery brings together a diverse group of 10 artists who share my passion for activism, history, and the photographic processes involved in telling their stories. With this question at its core, who do we see? My first experience in the museum world was in my hometown of Seattle, Washington. After graduating from the UW with a degree in history and Near Eastern archaeology, I volunteered to work in the newly relocated Wing Luke Museum, a small Asian art museum in the International District, now under the umbrella of the Smithsonian. As the Asian Pacific American experience, I ended up curating one of the first exhibitions in their new space on wearable art from Asia. I soon applied to graduate school and landed in New York City at NYU to study Near Eastern art and museology. It was in graduate school that I met Ibrahim al Kazi, a true national treasure of India, who passed away at 95 last month. al Kazi was an artist, a curator, a collector, and a visionary who believed in the highest standards of scholarship and presentation. He was my mentor and my fiercest supporter for over 20 years. Alkazi spearheaded an innovative nonprofit art space on 57th and 5th called the Center for International Contemporary Art, SICA, under the leadership of Bhupendra Kharia. These two men would alter the course of my life for the next 30 years and running. SICA's mission was Mr. Alkazi's vision recognize Western art history's lack of knowledge of Asian art and culture, and seek to redress the balance by placing emphasis on a more inclusive and in-depth investigation within international contemporary art. The inaugural exhibition in 1986 was a retrospective of Yayo Kusama, curated by Dr. Alexander Monroe and Dr. Reiko Tumi. The center acted as a think tank for artists, scholars, and the general public. It included an ongoing art database, exhibitions, publications, educational programming, and a gift store. 
The center closed in 1993. After working at Aperture, Mr. Altazi asked me to work with him on his personal collection of photographs that required proper organization. The 30,000 19th century photographs located in his London flat were the basis of the Alkazi collection of photography, where I was the executive director from 1995 to 2009. For the first 10 years, Dr. Sophie Gordon and Dr. Stephanie Roy worked with me and many young photographers, students, and scholars who took part in cataloging the bulk of the collection in three cities, New York, London, and New Delhi. With an ambitious collecting agenda, by 2006, the Alkazi collection of photography contained over 120,000 photographs. With the establishment of CP International and the Alkazi collection in 1997, we opened a 4,000 square foot space in Chelsea designed by Nandini Pukan Architects to house a third of the Alkazi collection within a research center. The commercial gallery, Sepia International, used the remaining 3,000 square feet for gallery space. This was one of the first instances where a private collection was held within the commercial space. Although unusual, CP International and the Alkazi collection served the general public and scholars alike by actively providing research materials, educational programming, and exposure to over 300 artists from the 19th century to the present. Essential to our mission was the intersection of photography as a document and that of fine art. This was a suitable focus for the 19th century material and its primary usage as documentation under the Raj. We invited scholars and students to reinterpret and rethink the understanding of these images often for their own scholarship, as well as pub our publication program that included 19th century, modern, and contemporary titles. Initially, our stable of artists at the Commercial Gallery, CP International, reflected the geographical area of the Alkazi collection, the Indian subcontinent, but eventually included important artists from Pakistan, Afghanistan, Japan, Korea, Turkey, Vietnam, the Philippines, China, and the U.S. In an exhibition entitled Vestiges in 2000, we presented the work of photographers Masao Yamamoto, Yukio Oyama, and Miyako Ichiuchi. Yamamoto insisted that a table be set up in the gallery with a suitcase of over 200 photographs from his series, A Box of Coup. He explained that in the installation of his work, each image could be interpreted as a word. And by letting visitors select images to place on the desk, viewers could create their own sentences or ideas. The word coup in the series title, A Box of Coup, means emptiness while also connoting a simultaneous fullness. The concept of coup, the definition and the way of looking at photographic works has informed my perception of photography ever since. Over the course of 11 years, CP International and the Alkazi Collection hosted 45 exhibitions. This included six extensive 19th century exhibitions, including our inaugural overview of the ACP entitled Reorientations, painted photography, as well as solo exhibitions on the works of Dean Dayal, John Edward Sachet, and Samuel Bourne. A tribute to the work of Shinzo and Rosa Fukuhara was also mounted under the direction of Dr. Noriko Fuku in collaboration with the Shiseido Photography Archive in Japan. In 2009, the Alkazi collection was consolidated and moved to New Delhi, where the Alkazi Foundation for the Arts holds the photographic collection under one roof. That same year, I opened Sepia Eye and later a commercial gallery on 27th Street in the Chelsea Arts District. I have recently reframed the gallery to a core group of 10 artists I have the pleasure of sharing with you now. As a curator, I have enjoyed working on many thematic exhibitions that tell a visual story of an idea, feeling, or place, whether fictitious or real. The fun is to combine the artist's work established, unknown, mid-career, emerging, to strengthen the narrative. The question I return to often is who do we see? When we interact with an image, we bring with us our own background, ideas, feelings to the experience. The artist may have a different story to tell, but it is within a group presentation that we may rethink, 
reimagine and experience a new dialogue with the object. Our artists with multiple, work with multiple processes, not only in their photo-based work, but also within the larger umbrella of contemporary art. Often with three-dimensional objects, we see our understanding of photography meld and expand by mixing early processes with modern techniques. I've compiled, compiled three overarching themes from my artist's work, which with our time frame will give you a peek into their individual practices. When constructing these themes, I noticed that each artist's work could fall interchangeably into any of the categories. Activism. One of the most prolific and politically motivated artists that I have the pleasure of working with is Vivon Syndrome. Sundram abandoned traditional painting in the early 1990s to explore sculpture, installation, photography, and video. His interest in perception, memory, history, and how they intersect with social problems and popular culture can be seen in his works. Several of his recent collaborative projects, although very different in aesthetics, involve the use of photographs, found objects, video, and three-dimensional constructs. In these collaborations, Syndrome assumes the role of conductor, curator, editor, and archivist. With these images from Retake of Amrita, Syndrome uses his own family's photographic trove, mostly from his grandfather, Amrao Shergel, an industrious photographer who documented himself and his family and their cosmopolitan life in Budapest, Paris, and Simla in the 1930s and 40s. Sundaram restructures and reimagines these relationships, traumas and personal histories within this rich visual storybook. Retake of Amrita also includes an audio-visual two-track video entitled Ma, a play on his grandmother's name, Marie Antoinette, and her role as mother to Vivon's own mother, Indira. I have curated two exhibitions of this series in New York at CP International and in Dallas at the Chrome Museum. It is fascinating to see that whatever, wherever this series is shown, all over the world, people remark about their own family and the migration and melding of their own histories as reflected in the work. In Trash, Vivon explores the social implications and aesthetics of urban waste and secondhand goods. Constructing a huge and fantastical cityscape in his New Delhi studio, entirely made out of garbage, the resulting composite photographs reimagine the dreams and aspirations of the architect as a grand city planner while simultaneously poking fun at the folly of such utopian misadventures. The series includes videos, installations, and color photographs to convey the texture of industrial waste but also sees beyond the materials to create a space for reflection. As seen in 12 Bed Wards, an installation representing a place where the garbage pickers who collected this material can rest. The beds are made from discarded soles of shoes, the only part of the shoe that is worth recycling. In Terra Optic, shown at CPI in 2017, Vivon continues the themes of recycling history and perception and reusing ancient materials. In his installation of black gold for the Kochi Biennial, archaeological shards and fragments were used to construct a lost city, a topographic plan that was also incorporated into a video shown at the Biennale. The video showed the lost city flooded with watery oil, which represented the black peppercorns from Kochi Kerala, which was considered black gold in the spice trade. When I first met Atul Bala over 20 years ago, he was working with installation, sculpture, and drawings. His later exploration into photography expanded his practice into performance and video. His obsession with water began early on, delving into the physical, historical, spiritual, and political significance within his life. Questioning the distribution, regulation, commodification, and pollution of water, Bala reflects on the encroaching changes of urban life as it intersects on a daily basis with the natural flow of the river. 
In the work Yemen Walk, he documents a five-day trek along the riverside, aiming to trace the relationship between the sacred Yamuna River and his home of New Delhi, India. At times through this journey, Bala was forced to climb fences and cross concrete overpasses to continue his quest. These modern obstacles weave their way into the fabric of daily life, connecting and hampering its development as well as its continuation. Bala describes his practice as an attempt to understand water, the way he perceives it, feels it, drinks it, swims in it, and sinks in it. His personal negotiation of water provides a stage for which to address larger political issues concerning bodies of water and the urban environment. Yemen Walk, which originally was made as a performance, has been shown as a video, a photographic installation, and in book form internationally. Charan Singh spent most of his professional life working as an HIV AIDS activist in India, extensively with sex workers. Through his photo series, he shows the reality of the life he has known with sincerity and focus. As he states, when I look at the history of Indian photography, I am overwhelmed by portraits of princely India and the prevailing exoticism around them. These portraits were about class, caste, and colonial hierarchies. When I make photographs, I want to make something queer, but also want to challenge these stereotypes about photography in India. Many of my subjects have never had a studio portrait made in their lifetime. Therefore, I attempted to create a space where people could feel comfortable, regardless of their class, caste, identity, gender, sexuality, performance. These are individual human beings, each with their own nuances. Recently, Jaron has returned to his studies while continuing to work in his photographic practice. His photographs delve into his personal journey and study of the history of art and photography, specifically in the representation of desire, identity, gender, sexuality, relationships, loss, trauma, and recovery. History. Serena Chopra has committed to long-term projects on communities from within, recounting her time and her relationships with modernity resulted after a five-year study of the people, customs, rituals, and life of this remote community. Her access to the royal family, workers, farmers, nightclubs, intimate family portraits, and the religious community highlighted their move towards modernity. In her Maju Katila series from 2012, shown both at CPI and at Harvard Art Museum last year, explored the lives in a Tibetan community in Delhi where thousands of exiles have lived for nearly 40 years. Chopra photographed and interviewed individuals, coupling image and text in a diary-like format to reveal the population's views on life and a communal optimism that one day they will return to Tibet. Chopra states, I wanted to get to know the real Tibetan, the person, his or her feelings, what his or her life was it like in reality. Perhaps I would gain insight into what freedom meant to them. In 2017, Chopra was commissioned to photograph people affected by the 1947 partition in both Pakistan and in India. Some of these series flank the entrance to the Partition Museum in Amritsar. In her work, Chopra takes us with her and shares her intimate connection to her subjects, allowing us familiarity and a connection to what and who we see. Anu Palakanathu Matthew and I first met via her research within the Alkazi collection to see examples in 19th century photography and how Indians from India were represented. Her research led to her reappropriating the work of Edward Curtis and his views of Native Americans in the early 20th century. In these works, Matthew creates a diptych 
with an original Curtis or another photograph culled from the National Archives depicting Native Americans. She masterfully reposes herself and states her position in the title as an Indian from India. By claiming the power to define and portray herself, she seems to share that power to those portrayed by Curtis and company. Born in England, raised in India, and now a professor in the US, Matthew's work continues to re-examine personal stories and historic events within her work. Through various methods and processes, Matthew retells the story, often collapsing time and space, as in her work, Regenerations. Regenerations looks at family photographs in tandem with their stories across generations. Family members grow old and disappear, and new ones appear in these looped video works. Her use of lenticular printing in the Virtual Immigrant series pairs audio recordings of workers in call centers in India with their portraits literally spliced into the Western guise they wear for work. Questions about immigration, nationality, and accepted histories filter through Matthew's work, continually asking the viewer to question their own history or the history that we are taught. Her current series, The Unremembered, focuses on the 2.5 million Indian soldiers who fought for the British in World War II. It is a mammoth project that has taken her all over India and abroad to uncover the proof through personal stories and family photographs. This is a small taste of the physical objects created by sourced images. Additional information on this series may be found on our website, as well as on Matthews. She will also be speaking on October 27th at the Photographic Resource Center in Cambridge. For more information, please refer to the news section of our website. Kiana Mestre was introduced to me through two avenues of her life, photography and writing about photography. At her ICP graduate presentation, I was blown away by her work and her use of material to convey her story. The series, The Mist in Mystic, uses a process Mestre calls water collage, in which she immerses found imagery underwater, letting the liquid dictate the movement and placement of the pieces. The final image is then embedded within a white silhouette of curly hairstyles found online. This project also draws on photography and writing since it, since it was inspired by a short story she had written about the unruly nature of her own hair and the difficulty she felt fitting in because of it. Two of Maastricht's theories, namesake and inherited patterns, draw on the story within her name, Kiana which was the name given to a nylon fabric invented by DuPont in the 1960s. In Inherited Pattern, she visits the archives of DuPont and reuses their advertising photographs and creates a collage combining the fantasy of advertising with real life. Master began her blog, Dodge and Burn, to expand to a more inclusive history of photography highlighting contributions to the medium by people within underrepresented cultures. Her recent posts highlight fem female identifying photographers and those of African, Asian, Latino, Native American, and Pacific Islander cultures. Nandita Rahman's stunning images of Cinema Playhouse throughout India touch on the history of the Cinema House as a place of community, architectural design, and a visual culture. Rahman's family also operated one such cinema house, and it was a playground for the artists growing up. Her subsequent interest in photography led her to documenting the series in every aspect of these cinemas, from the seats to the projector booth, as well as the individuals who operated them often for a lifetime. This body of work was shown at the George Eastman House and at the Museum of the Moving Image in the last several years in tandem with film series in each venue. The original formal black and white photograph series from 2006 to 2009 was expanded to include color work in 2014. Rahman's most recent work takes on a more conceptual gaze, 
often combining still life with an in-depth study of places, people, and scholars with their own histories intermingling with her own interests and ideas. Process. Pamela Singh began her photographic career as a photojournalist documenting Indian women in the military and in the Chipko tree hugger movement. These Chipko photographs from the 1990s documented the tradition of ecofeminism. Although many of its supporters were men, women were not only its backbone, but also its main because they were the ones most affected by the rampant deforestation, which led to lack of firewood and water for drinking and irrigation. Singh's work will be included in an upcoming film on the work of Dr. Vandana Shiva, a prominent activist for the food justice movement. I placed Pamela's work in this section based mostly on her experimentation with various materials and photography. Her work is primarily self-portraiture, but her use of traditional painting techniques are reminiscent of miniature painting. Our current online exhibition displays her early series on Fayum heads from 2004, where she merges the features of her own face into those famous paintings from Roman Egypt. As Singh recounts, the inspiration for this series came from looking at a book of these portraits and finding them so familiar that she saw her own face and those of her friends and family within them. She expanded on the use of painting on photographs with her series Tantric Self-Portraits, creating unique works of photography imbued with written chants, blessings, and omens using oil paint, acrylic, gold mud, and vermilion pigment. In her series Treasure Maps, she embellishes the face of the image with glitter pens to elevate their impact, much like the 19th century practitioners who painted the black and white portraits they took of their patrons with detailed rugs, jewelry, and ornamental cloth. Beatrice Pericone's process is about creating and capturing a fleeting moment careful, attentive research and experimentation into the reaction of different materials in water collide with the final output that is left up to chance and nature. She uses video and photography to document transition, movement, and change, and to arrest in time the magic of water interacting with the materials she submerges. I first met Petaconi at CP International and was transfixed by her video work. I was haunted by these and the feeling I had in revisiting them over in the next few days in my mind. They were transformative. Petaconi's video works have a simultaneous uplifting and intriguing effect. The viewer can recognize some aspects of the creative process, but the mysterious qualities linger and entreat the viewer to take another look. When I opened Sepia Eye, I went back to Petaconi to ask her to join the gallery. In the last five years, we devoted the Chelsea space to two solo exhibitions, Alien and Subject to Change. Over a period of nine months, Petaconi produced a handbound artist book per month using Polaroid film. Each book of the Alien series was encased in linen and was wrapped with a long cord. The complete history of the series can only be found in the accompanying book, Something Alien, with text by Lal Rexer. Subject to Change was our last exhibition in the gallery. Petaconi continued to work in Polaroid, but this time in a larger 20 by 24 inch format. The photographs and video in the series were motivated by a trip to New Orleans in which Petaconi was struck by the abuses of the land from the water. I saw how much in that land is felt, the double aspect of water, life and death. Trust by photography, video, painting. Her work examines the concept of balance applied to natural systems. Petaconi's entitled her work, Gia, in reference to the ancient Greek personification of Mother Earth. Born of chaos, but as chaos receded, Gaia came into being complete in herself. 
The transformational process that emerges from destruction into light is at the core of the Gia series. Bhupendra Karya. Early in this talk, I mentioned Mr. Karya, the director of Sika in New York. Karya was an exceptional artist, a curator, a photographer, and a master printer. He passed away in 1994, leaving behind a strong body of work that depicts India in the 1960s and 70s. Karya's formal, bold, visual sense, paired with his masterful printing, often toned with gold chloride, made for a compelling archive of work I am honored to represent. Karya grew up in Bombay and attended graduate studies in Tokyo, where he learned photography. After teaching and heading photography and design departments at the University of Southern California and in Baroda, Karya moved to the United States to work with Cornell Kappa, his mentor and friend, in establishing the International Center for Photography in New York. The bulk of his work was taken during extensive photographic journeys, traveling for weeks, sometimes months at a time, covering by his accounts some 80,000 miles across India's rural landscape. Karya's early motivations for these trips seem to have been an anthropological impulse to explore and record rural India and its creative traditions, textiles, pottery, and architectural decoration. Alongside his friend and artist Jyoti Bhatt, Karya spent time recording his observations of rural and small time life with larger concerns about the social, political, and environmental challenges facing contemporary India. He felt the foundation for all artistic practice were the crafts of local industries and was compelled to record the processes, places, and individual artisans before they perished with modernization. I've only touched on our CPI artists and their work. I urge you to visit our website, www.cpi.com, for additional material on each artist, our exhibitions, news, and publications, spanning many titles on photography. Thank you. Thank you, Essa. Have I been unmuted? I have been unmuted. Thank you, Essa. That was that was spectacular. Um, so much of that, I'm sure, is 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 new to our viewers. Um, I wanted to start with something very specific um, before we branch out into some more general things. Uh, one of your artists uh, you mentioned is using lenticular photography, and I suspect that that is. Uh, uh, something that everyone knows what it is, but nobody knows what the name is. So if you could briefly give us a little uh, idea of what lenticular photography is. See, all my books are in the other room. I could just go like this and show you. Um, actually, I, I, I think it's possible. Um, Anu is on this call. Um, so I thought maybe we can invite her to talk about it. There she is. Is that okay if we unmute her? Is that, Casey, can I do that? I think I just unmuted Anu, yeah. Nope. Try again, Anu. Okay. So thanks, Essa, for putting me on the spot. <laughs> so, I'll, I'll answer the question, but I figured since you were here, it would be a wonderful Yeah, yeah. I have a few um, artists here, so this is lovely. So, you know, I didn't grow up in this culture, but um, my husband likes to say that, you know, you used to get those crackerjack images of the woman winking at you. So from one angle, you see one image and the other, you see another. That's a lenticular print. And it basically is two or more images that are spliced into strips and reassembled using a software and a lens is put on top of it. So from one angle, you see one image and from another angle, you see another, the second. Back to you, Essa. Exactly. We've, we've all seen them, those sort of, uh, you know, those postcards that you get at the beach where it's one image when you tilt it one way and another image when you tilt it another way. Um, uh, so we've kind of all seen them in, in a 
very casual form, but I, I know a number of artists that have incorporated them into, into art photography and it makes a, a fascinating uh, a technique to, to, explore other, to explore other things. And until I uh, saw artists that used it, I didn't know that the term for it was lenticular. So uh, we, all, we all learned something can new. I just, can I just jump in, Evan, because there's a few things about this body of work. Uh, first of all, it's almost life-size. Um, they're something like four by three or, I mean, they really have a presence. And the other part of it is the audio which I love because it's actually recordings of the subjects talking about their own experiences as call workers. And um, there was a period where um, they were supposed to be American or Western. And so they got to choose names of what they wanted to be when they got on the phone with you. And so they chose, you know, their favorite movie stars and Arnold and and all these things and it's them actually recounting to Anu their own stories and so you're looking at this piece that literally shifts from them wearing western garb to them wearing um, Indian clothes and then you also hear their own views about the process so it's a really interactive piece and uh, a few years ago uh, there was a solo exhibition at the Royal Ontario Museum, and it coincided with Nuit Blanche, uh, an evening of um, photography and video all over the city. And uh, Anu actually figured out a way to project it on the entry wall to the Royal Ontario Museum, and you called a phone because everybody has a cell phone that's connected to them now, and you could hear the audio. So you had this giant dinosaur, and then behind it <laughs> was Anu's piece. It was really lovely. Uh, thank you, Anu. Um, so one of the ways that, uh, that Casey and I talk about inviting uh, uh, exhibitors to PGH Photo is, is that certain uh, collection of of attributes uh, are important to us, and and Essa, you you personify those um, in that um, while your uh, your program is very intellectual and uh, and appeals to scholars and institutions, you yourself are very personable and open, and and so even people who are not perhaps scholars um, can have uh, you know an, an interaction with you that's 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 gratifying. Um, so I'm sort of curious to hear you talk a little bit about your relationship between, you know, your, where you started, which was, which was purely institutional and, and, uh, and intellectual and, and working as an archivist, to branching out into the, the, the sort of retail gallery world. Yes. It was never part of the plan, um, but the good thing about life is sometimes it takes you where you least expect it. And uh, I met Mr. Alkazi and he tapped into quite a few things that I was interested in. Um, but one of them was he gave me the possibility and the opportunity to put together a major collection. I mean, I was a graduate student and he said, oh, come to England and take a look at this photography collection. And there were 30,000 photographs on the floor. So I said, well, it's going to take me a while, and it did. And so that was my museology hat. I got to put together the systems and, you know, running in three countries. And then um, Mr. Okazi said to me once, what do I do with this when I'm gone? And I said, well, we should talk to people. So um, Sophie Gordon, who's based in London, um, now the curator of the Royal Collections at Windsor, uh, she was the curator of the collection then. And uh, the three of us went around the country and we went to the George Eastman House and we went to New Mexico and we went to everywhere in between and talked to people about their collections. And the last place we went was Harvard and we located a Dean Dayall uh, collection, 19th century photographer. Uh, from India in early 20th. And um, it was unfortunately very difficult to find and not being cared for uh, very well. It's now at the Peabody Essex Museum, by the way. 
uh, in Salem. And um, Mr. Alkazi looked at me and he said, um, you have to find real estate and we're gonna do it on our own. So I found the space, which was a uh, junk jewelry um, space and we gutted it and, and built Sepia International. And that's when I became a gallerist. And, um, you know, working in the 19th century, you did get to work with living people. Sometimes, sorry, my artists are here. <laughs> it's a little bit easier. Um, but uh, Mr. Alkazi said, this is too big for your office. Uh, so maybe we should think about making it a venue for exhibition. And what was interesting at that time, and this is a 98, 97, um, was there wasn't a lot of uh, photography from Asia. There were some uh, galleries that did show, especially Japanese work, um, but uh, we went to an exhibition actually of Raghavir Singh's at a very small gallery in Soho. And Mr. Alkazi said, you know, there should be a, a larger space for this. Um, so he really let me find the work that I was interested in. He didn't want it to just be India. So we looked at work. I hired an incredible woman from Japan named um, Akemi Yoniyama and Saya Rupani and then Noel Shmetau. And we formed this core group of people and we really worked as a team to choose artists that we responded to and um, that we felt needed a space to show their work. And because the space was so huge, 3,000 square feet, it was more like a museum show. And I think we were also confusing to people because we were both a private collection where things were not for sale and then a commercial gallery. So I think uh, we had one 19th century show a year from the private collection and then four shows a year from um, the modern and contemporary. What was amazing about it is because it had the beginning of photography with the 19th century, um, it really formed a continuum up to the present. And that was an exciting aspect of it because it was connected. And to answer, I think, a little bit of your question, I had a lot of curators come in looking at the 19th century, very interested in, in researching and studying and going through it. We worked with a lot of scholars over the years. And then they would see our contemporary and modern shows. So um, it was a good it was a good fit. A little unusual at the time, but it, it provided a, a, a space for both. Um, I'm including some links in the chat. Uh, one that I already put up is Anu's show, which is uh, up in Cincinnati right now, I think. And I'm adding another one now, which is uh, an interview um, that, uh, that, that Essa shared with me that um, you can click on if you want to read a little bit more about another curator's approach. And I just want to give a little shout out too to our mutual friend who is online with us, which is Barbara Tannenbaum from the Cleveland wow. Museum of Art, a curator who also, um, I know, has an interest in, um, in uh, there she is, the, the camera just went on, um, uh, an interest, I think, especially in 19th century Indian photography. And it's, I don't know, I, I, I know that, that there are certain curators like, like Barbara that, that have found it on their own, but I think it's, it's undiscovered territory for for a lot of uh, North American viewers and and uh, and curators, is that your experience too, Essa? Well, I think when we started, um, I, I remember having a conversation with Al Kazi, who said, "Well, this isn't Holy Land photography. No one's going to come." And when we opened, uh, we were on the front page of the New York Times art section in a giant. Uh, wonderful review by Vicki Goldberg um, talking about the work. And so I think that my part of my job over the years is to provide a platform really for this work. And I, I mentioned it a little bit in the talk about mixing uh, work. Um, one of the uh, conversations I had early on was with Spencer Throckmorton, um, who has a gallery here in New York City that focuses on Latin American photography. And his director at the time, Yona Becker, was a good friend of mine. And he said, as a focus, like find a thing that nobody has and, and go with that. And it really helped me. I think that um, initially 
uh, we went to PhotoFest, I think, uh, one of the first years, and there was a focus on uh, work from uh, um, Korea. And um, James Nakagawa, Osama James Nakagawa was also there exhibiting. And we came home with three artists. Wow. So um, when we saw the work and we responded to it, we, we got it up at, at CPF, so. Nice, nice. Um, I, I always like to um, highlight in these talks um, the pluses and minuses of the situation that we're in. Uh, it's always unfortunate that, um, that we're not in person and that we're not welcoming you to Pittsburgh and that there is not going to be a live PGH photo um, in a few weeks. Uh, but the, the good side, I guess, is that um, we've got people from the West Coast and the East Coast and perhaps not even in North America who are able to join us in these talks, which, which, uh, which I enjoy a lot. And, it, and it, um, it brings to my mind how we look at things, right? There's the, there's, there's, there's the, the computer screen way of looking at things and, and uh, you know, a JPEG is a JPEG is a JPEG. And then there's the actual physical interaction with, with an object. And, and I know that some of your artists uh, do explore the work as an object. And also you have a tremendous uh, publishing uh, practice as well, which, which you can show a little bit on screen, but which one can also experience a little bit more easily. So if there are books that you'd like to talk about and perhaps the materiality of some of your artists, um, it's, uh, it's a way right. for us to sort of combine the two. Yes, I have some show and tell that I'd love to um, share with you. And um, I think just to touch on your question about looking at work, it's, I think we're all wrestling with it, you know? I mean, you can look at photographs and video um, on, on screen. Um, the first time I saw Beatrice's work was on a computer screen, um, but in both of the shows we had at CPI, we actually, um, well, Beatrice uh, formatted um, the video so it actually fit into this little space that I had, so it was immersive. So you could walk in and it just, people weren't coming out after a while. <laughs> it was like, what was going on in there? But it was just the space where you could be interacting with the video and be on your own. And that's really hard. I mean, I guess you could do it on a computer screen, but it's a little bit different. Um, and then, you know, I think that I touched on my interest in process. And I think that's really hard to show on um, on a on a screen. And I'll give you an example. This is one of Anu's works that I actually showed in this presentation. And because it's kind of a modern oratone, it's probably hard for you guys to see um, with the light. But this is something as a cased object that you're meant to hold. And like a book you're supposed to um, look at it and it actually reflects. This is one of the occasions that I'm not wearing all black, um, but uh, it's a very intimate way of looking at an object. And I don't know if you can see this, but even um, the leather is all tooled and handmade. Um, and so something like that is really hard to show on a screen. Um, and behind me is a good example. This is a work by uh, Kuchiro Kurita. It's a platinum palladium print from Japan, um, 1979, um, Bubbles. And I'm sure that you can kind of see it, but it looks kind of gray and black. Um, but if you really see it close, you could actually even see the emulsion because he uses um, gumpy paper, which is a form of rice paper. And so it, you can see the emulsion actually on the image. So it doesn't really translate even on a screen and also in book. Um, so, uh, let's see. Ko Koichiro is, uh, is a kind of nostalgic name for me. Uh, he used to have um, sort of a gallery, but more of a studio. 
yeah. um, where he specialized in platinum palladium printing and he did workshops on it and he did his own work. And he was a stereotype, but in the most positive sense of the uh, obsessive, quiet, scholarly Japanese man just, just had to do everything just exactly one way and only worked in one medium. And I, I saved them. He used to send holiday cards. A holiday cards doesn't begin to cover it. He would, he would hand um, um, uh, attach a small, I'd say, three by four inch platinum print to some beautiful piece of paper with a little signature of, you know, best wishes in 2007, Koichiro, and just always the most exquisite, thoughtful work. He was, he's a, just a lovely man. He's um, relocated to Japan and set up a studio there with his wife, who's also a photographer. And um, you're right, we actually, we had a retrospective of his work that filled the entire gallery, 3,000 square feet. And during that time, we offered two printing workshops for salt printing. And the studio that we used was Ed Grosdas, who's mm -hmm. a wonderful uh, photographer. I met him through his work in Afghanistan. And so we had, uh, we had two salt print workshops that he led. And I said to him, I have never done one thing in two days. <laughs> I'm usually doing about a hundred things in one day. And by the end of two days, I actually had a beautiful salt print that I had made and it was incredible. Lovely. Yeah. So I'm gonna show you, uh, I'm not sure Beatrice is still here. There she is. Um, but there's a lovely book. Uh, I cannot claim any credit. It was uh, all from her in an incredible exhibition um, that was held at the uh, Marimoti Collection um, in Reggio Emilia, Italy um, in 2013. Um, but it's kind of a treasure and it's in the uh, Museum of Modern Art library um, amongst other things and there's an incredible if if you if there are new yorkers here uh beauty currently has one of uh, two of her videos being projected on uh, the facade of the brooklyn library on tuesdays and thursdays and that's an incredible uh way to see them and it's safe because it's outside. Uh, so this is um, a book that, an artist book that Beatrice did. It's gonna be hard for me to show you, um, but you can see there's a little Japanese uh, text on the side there. And then this box, which is kind of like a jewel box, opens. And let's see if I can carefully do it. Um, it really is one of these um, representations of an exhibition. So it opens up like this, and then each part ref has a reflection in the work. So um, this is a score that Beatrice uh, asked a com composer to do for the video. It's never been played, but it's the concept of creating the music. This is part of the video piece. And it's also on the back. I'm sorry, it's upside down. Um, and then this is the chemistry uh, of the work that And these were Polaroids that were held in um, plastic frames, lucite frames. So you really just had these around the space. Um, and then what was so incredible about the video is um, it was completely immersive. You walked in, there was a kind of beanbag chairs in the middle. It was completely black. And then around, around 360 degrees around was this video. That's yeah, beautiful, it's a beautiful object.
it, uh, it brings to mind another artist who I think you've had uh, experience with, Dianita Singh, who was in uh, the last uh, Carnegie International, who also has uh, done a lot of these kind of make an exhibit at home with using accordion prints and books that can be set up as their own exhibits so that you become your own curator. Yes, actually, it's funny that you mention um, Dianita because in her last book, she put in a little bookmark and I was going to read it because I, it's actually a quote from Saul LeWitt, but I think it speaks a lot about um, photography books and especially artist books. I'm going to take these off. Artist books are, like any other medium, a means of conveying art ideas from the artist to the viewer or reader. Unlike most other media, they are available to all at low cost. They do not need a special place to be seen. They are not valuable except for the ideas they contain. They contain the material in a sequence which is determined by the artist. The reader or viewer can read the material in any order, but the artist presents it as he or she thinks it should be. Art shows come and go, but books stay around for years. They are works themselves, not reproductions of work. That's lovely. Yeah, it's a good That's one. Lovely. Well, I know there are some, some, some book fans, some photo book fans who are here with us that agree with that um, in, in every possible way. Um, I see that it is just a little bit past 7.30 and we have a few questions, so I think We'll open it up to those last few questions and then, and then, and then call it a night. Um, uh, we have one question um, from Cynthia who asks, have you spent much time in India? And if so, do you do any collecting for the gallery there? Um, I spend a lot of time in India. Um, I have been there twice. Before COVID in the last, uh, I was there in November and then again in February. Uh, the first time I was there was in 95, I think. And I usually go once or twice a year. Um, and there's a couple gaps there, but I spend a lot of time there. Um, I used to have an office there in New Delhi. And um, so I went there rather uh, regularly and because I wore two hats, uh, the head of the Akazi collection as well as um, CP International, I worked in the private collection during the day and I met my artists at night. Um, I did, I was a little bit of a, a, a mule. I carried a lot of art back from my artists. Sure. And actually Sunil Gupta and I had a um, suitcase that we called our book suitcase because the best way to get books were to fill it in a suitcase and carry it back so um yes i'm i'm very familiar with going back and forth carting all sorts of stuff from india um i'm working on a project there now um which is in rajasthan which is in northwest india um so i've been spending a lot of time there um but uh one day I hope to go back. Right, right. When when uh, when we're not when we're not captives to our own borders anymore. Yes. Yeah. Um, another question from M. Dunn is: uh, uh, Essa, a number of your artists are under the age of fifty. Can you speak to what you look for in younger artists? Have they done more than one significant series when you take them on for representation over your many years of focus in this area? Have you seen growth in Western collectors' interest in contemporary work from the subcontinent? Well, Miss Dunn, um, let me start. Uh, you know, my roster has changed. So when I first started with um, CP International, uh, I represented the estate of Raghavar Singh for about 15 years. Um, so I think there were older artists that I worked with maybe at Sepia International. And when I started Sepia, I, I felt I needed a representation of younger artists, mid-career and established. Um, and the archive, like 
with Bhupendra Karya's archive, that's obviously an established artist. Um, but I think Kiana and, and uh, Beatrice, um, both artists that I saw their work and I really wanted to work with them, not only because I loved their work, but I really liked them. And it is a little bit of a marriage when you are a, a gallerist and you take on an artist. It's a commitment to, to uh, to represent them. And um, so uh, I think that, you know, I see a lot of um, young artists and I haven't um, taken on many new people. Uh, I think Kiana is probably the last, um, uh, I'm sorry, Shuma Sankar Bose is another young artist. I saw his work and I, I just was blown away. And so I, I had given him a show. But, you know, I think with uh, looking at work, you really have to make an effort to do studio visits and to get to know the artists. And for me, that took a long time um, in most cases. And as far as people's interest in this material, I was actually talking to Evan about this the other day. Um, when I first started, I felt that I worked mostly with curators um, and it was filling in gaps, holes in their collections. And there were private collectors, but I would say that most of my clients were curators and I liked working with museums. And it was also a long-term commitment. Um, and something that happened uh, early on was there was a mixture of uh, uh, curatorial funds and curators, not just from photography, but also from Asia. And so that was really interesting because, for example, uh, at Harvard, um, they formed a South Asian photography initiative, which was a combination of two curators from their um, Sackler department, uh, Indian and Islamic, and then two curators from the Bog. And it was really to build a collection that would try to offset the lack of material. Um, and it was interesting because the, the curators from the Sackler might not have known a lot about photography, um, but they knew a lot about India. And then the uh, curators from the Fog knew a lot about photography, but not, maybe not so much about India. And it's an amazing collection that they've put together over the years, probably the last 20 years they've been doing that. And that happens a lot, um, even Philadelphia, uh, they, they share their acquisition funds and so they purchase between departments. Excellent. Um, well, um, I think we probably we try to keep things an hour-ish and so we're there. So unless there's a last minute question, um, I'm going to encourage everyone to cut and paste the links in the chat if they would like to explore them because they'll disappear as soon as the, the session ends. And to re-remind you that if you would like to participate in our collector's view, um, to be looking on our website um, uh, to, um, uh, to, um, to contribute their own, from their own collection, uh, we would love to hear from you. Um, we have a chat around the corner with Rebecca Semph from um, um, the Center for Creative Photography talking about her, um, answer, her new Ansel Adams book, which uh, we're very excited to, to participate with her. She's, she's great. Um, she's, she, I think she partnered with SilverEye a few years ago to be the curator for a, uh, for a, a, a guest exhibit. So she's got some relationship to Pittsburgh, but we're, we're, we're thrilled to have her back. And Essa, thank you so much. This was this was, this was lovely. And and while we're we're sorry that um, we're not going to see you in person either for the chat or as a as an exhibitor at PGH Photo, we're looking forward to 2021 and and rectifying at least the exhibitor part. Yeah. So that we can meet you personally. Thank you so much. Um, anything else to add, Casey? 
I think that's it. Um, we thank you all for attending. Uh, I posted the link for the Rebecca Senth talk uh, coming up September 23rd. So we do invite you to sign up for that. It's free. Um, it's in partnership with Pittsburgh Arts and Lectures and Silver Eye. So um, you'll, you'll find the sign up on Pittsburgh Arts and Lectures website. Um, we also have some talks coming up. We've paired with um, Small Mall to do Pittsburgh focused um, photographer talks. And right. we've got two coming up in September with Sue Sorry, Abrams. And as part of that, right, who's here. And uh, Curtis Reeves, who's also here. So hi to you guys and look forward to hearing from you. Um, if you're interested in those, you can go to, I'll type it in the chat here, smallmallpgh.com and you can sign up for those. Those are free as well. So we hope you will join us at some of those future talks. Um, and do keep an eye out for um, our, our upcoming collectors talks. So we invite you to submit those things. They'll be up on the website shortly.